Hi everybody, Corrine Smith here with number 15 in the episodes of Studying Thoreau, a video series where I show you resources that you can use to study the life and writings of our favorite guy, American author and naturalist, Henry David Thoreau. Last time I showed you picture books for the youngest readers amongst us. Today we are going to look at books for young readers that are a little bit older and that are a little more adept at reading. And we're gonna move into even high school and young adult materials as well. My name's Corrine Smith. I was a librarian for a long time, um, uh, love books, love Thoreau. So that's why I'm doing this series. Uh, I've done a lot of research on Henry, written a couple of books about him. One you'll see in a little bit. And I currently serve as the supervisor of the shop at Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. This is my own series. This is my own perspective of uh, the range of these materials, their history, uh, Henry's history, and uh, how useful these books can be for you. Um, a lot of them are, hit, are fiction, but you can learn a lot from fiction, especially historical fiction, especially if it's done well. Know, which some of them are. And all of the books that I mentioned here are on bibliographies on th travelswiththoreau.com, also on a link down in the summary below. And here you will be able to find how to get these books. A lot of them are out of print. So in that case, you will be sent to book dealer sites, used book dealer sites on that list. Now, today in discussing these children's nonfiction and fiction books, I will be drawing on concepts and genres that I covered in previous episodes, like the biography episode, the fiction episode, and even last time, the picture book episode. <laughs> we actually are following a logical sequence <laughs> here, here in these videos. I promise you there is a method to this madness. And I've got a lot I want to share with you today. So let's take a few minutes first to think about the history of Henry Thoreau's growing reputation over time. Of course, you know that he was not famous in his lifetime. And what, you know, famous, I mean, I think it's even a stretch to think that he was famous by the time the 1906 set came out with the 20 volumes of his writings. You know, it took the work of friends first like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Bronson Alcott and Frank Sanborn and Harrison Gray Otis Blake to uh, further Thoreau's reputation enough that the 11 volume set of his writings could come out in the 1880s, 1890s, and that 20 volume set could come out in 1906, issued by Houghton Mifflin. And then of course, other people picked up the ball from around that time too. And I outlined all of that in the journal, the two journal episodes. So go back and revisit that if you, if you haven't um, seen it before. So moving into the 20th century then, interest in both Thoreau's life and his writings continued to grow, especially among college professors, but also writers and also random people who found themselves in Henry's words and who, who were looking for connections and found them with him. We started getting formal researched biographies about Thoreau. And then of course, we hit the magical 1960s. What was happening in the 1960s? <laughs> a lot of you know, there's a lot of you like, like me, we, we were all there um, exponentially. Everything that Henry wrote about came to the surface. It was in our faces, individual rights, civil rights, the role of government in our lives. Should we be fighting a war that we don't want? Um, uh, the importance of nature and the environment, the problems of crass consumerism and just buy, 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 instead of simplify, simplify, simplify. Hell. And his quotes and greeting cards started showing up on greeting cards and posters. And of course, this is when we get the groundbreaking book in Wildness is the Preservation of the World with the color photographs by Elliot Porter, quotes by Henry David Thoreau, furthers not only Thoreau's reputation, but also Elliot Porter's and also the beginning of the coffee table book. I talked about this in the quotes episode. Go back and look if you haven't seen it. 
Yeah, so that's 1962. And then 1967 is Henry's 150th birthday. And what do we get for that? A stamp, a stamp with Henry's face on it, courtesy of American artist Leonard Baskin. Kind of makes him look like a craggy hippie, but he, you know, <laughs> it suited the times, didn't it? So that was July of 1967 when the stamp came out for Henry's 150th birthday. And then six months later, we can turn on our radios and we hear a, a new song by a new group called the Stone Ponies. And they've got a really nice featured singer named Linda Ronstadt. And you can hear her singing, you and I travel to the beat of a different drum. Oh, can't you tell by the way I run every time you make guys of me? Thank you, Linda. By the way, trivia question for the day. Who wrote that song? Do you know? Well, you will in, in a second. Mike Nesmith of the Monkees. Yep. Good stuff. And yes, those are my original record albums. Okay. So, and obviously, there was a lot of civil disobedience going on in the country, too. And then we get to the year 1970. And this year is important for our purposes here for two reasons. First of all, in the spring, schools and colleges and universities and town squares were celebrating in big time the very first Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970. And, you know, Henry was a big component of that in many places. And before the year was out, Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee, two playwrights, would write The Night the Rose Spent in Jail, a play a thinly disguised anti-war script that equates Henry's own resistance to civil government and protesting the war with Mexico with what was happening in our own streets and the protests against the war in Vietnam. And it's the perfect time at this time for other teachers and writers who read the in College to want to introduce him to their high school students and then later to elementary kids. So, Excerpts of Walden and civil disobedience start showing up in American literature textbooks. And once some of these kids read Thoreau in class, they're going to want to uh, read more about him afterward or read more of his writings afterward. Um, you know, The Night Thoreau Spent in Jail was also um, studied at that time, still is, still is, and still is performed. So yeah, the kids might want to read more about Thoreau outside of class. Teachers might want to start assigning reports about Thoreau. Where are these people going to get their information? No, 1960s, 1970s, even 1980s? No internet, no. We've, we've gotten used to instant information. Can't get it then, no. So um, where can they go? Well, they could turn to the adult biographies because by then, 1962 was when Walter Harding's Days of Henry Thoreau came out. Again, in the 60s, um, 470 pages long. Don't know if a high schooler would read it. Uh, I didn't read it in high school, I can tell you that. I don't know if I would have been intimidated by that long. I probably would have started it and not finished it, is the thing. Uh, and whether high school libraries would have had it on their shelves or not by then, mm, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Now, we did have, if you remember, if you lived through that time, we did have old biographical series of books that individual volumes would be a different person. But you know, as I remember, a lot of them were presidents or inventors or composers. Ironically, American authors didn't get much press, <laughs> didn't get much literary attention really until the teachers started focusing on them and started you know, assigning papers. So then where else are you going to go back then for information? Well, we have our trusty annual encyclopedia. This is the T volume from my childhood set, the 1966 World Book Encyclopedia. By the way, doesn't everybody have their childhood <laughs> encyclopedia still? Still? <laughs> Um, so encyclopedias were supposed to be the most recent information that we had, except, of course, that as soon as they were published, they were a year out of date. 
Um, here's the two volume, the two column entry for Henry with the 1861 picture of him in full beard and a nice little picture of Walden Pond written by Reginald Cook, who was a professor at Middlebury College uh, in Vermont. And it's okay. This is the 1966 volume. So it does say that Henry was uh, an influence on Mahatma Gandhi and on Leo Tolstoy. Of course, doesn't mention Martin Luther King Jr. at all. I have a feeling this specific entry was written many years earlier and they just kept reprinting it because they hadn't, hadn't caught up with Walter Harding yet. Um, so, and that's not enough information to write a whole report on and get new information. So no. So where are people gonna go for information? Where are the students gonna go for information? And then if you also consider at the time the ongoing research in developmental psychology, the realization that children are not just tiny adults, they are cognitively different. They need educational materials that are designed a little bit differently um, to meet their needs. And sure, you can entertain them all day long with metaphorical books about bunnies and foxes and all kinds of animals. But in the end, they, they really deserve real books about real people, real, real life things. And so when you mix all this stuff together, all of these circumstances, doesn't it make sense then that children's books about Henry David Thoreau start coming out in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. See, it makes sense. It makes sense. So we're going to look at four categories of books here, biographies, historical fiction, contemporary fiction, and graphic novels. So first up are biographies. Now, back in the biography episode, I talked about some of the challenges in writing them because it can be a daunting task. You have this person's full life in front of you. How do you convey that to a reader in an understandable way, right? First of all, you cannot share everything you learn. <clears throat> Unless, of course, you are Laura Dossal Walls, who wrote the definitive biography of Henry, came out in 2017, Henry David Thoreau, A Life. 500 pages. 75 additional pages of notes. This is how much you can write about Henry. <clears throat> can't do that for kids. <laughs> no, you can't. So what, what do you do? You can't just water it down, but you have to pick and choose and you have to condense and distill um, in a way that's easy enough for young people to understand. Here's, a, here's an assignment for you. Try defining transcendentalism for a young person. <laughs> Try defining transcendentalism, period, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not so easy. So you have to decide which stories to tell too because you've got a limited amount of time and space. This is something that I faced firsthand when I wrote my book, Henry David Thoreau for Kids. Came out uh, in 2016 and uh, published by Chicago Review Press, part of their four kids series. They have dozens upon dozens upon dozens of these books about different people and events and, and concepts. And they didn't have one for Thoreau. So I pitched it and that's how I got it. Um, so one of the issues that I struggled with was whether or not to tell the story of Henry and Edward Hoare setting fire to the woods. And I reached out to some Thoreauvian friends and asked them if they thought I should include it in the book. Several of them said no. Uh, and I guess I was not surprised by that. But what I decided in the end was to include it because I figured that would show that Henry was human and fallible and to ignore that time in his life or to avoid it would be to paint a different picture of him, really. You can paint a different picture of somebody by not revealing true facts, right? Okay, so figuring out which stories to tell is a difficult part and how to tell them is even trickier for the younger audience. Okay, so this is my combination uh, biography and activity book for middle grade readers, 21 activities that uh, you can participate in with very little materials that uh, represent Henry. And no, setting fire to the woods is not one of them. 
<laughs> and no, neither is spending the night in jail. Although writing to your congressman is, is in there. Okay, so that's that. So let's go back historically to some of these standalone biographies. So the first one we have is Down to Earth at Walden by Mary Lynn K. Roach, came out in 1980. She did the text. She also did the illustrations, including Map of Concord. And this is a basic, simple biography, and it's it's quite lovely. And even though it's written in 1980, um, it's still it's still it's still good. And some of her some of her drawings. Here's the bean field. Some of her drawings are really, you know, worthy of framing. I think. Now, yeah, sure. If you hand this to a person today, it looks old fashioned, looks old timey, especially maybe the inside, but it's still got good, good information in it, obviously out of print, but you know, can still be useful to hand to somebody down to earth at Walden. In 1985, we got A Man Named Thoreau by Robert Burley with illustrations by Lloyd Bloom. I showed you this in the picture book episode because I also wanted to show you the second picture book that uh, Robert Burley did with Wendell Minor, the one that I love. Go back and see that episode if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I do have a couple of questions. This again is a simple biography. Uh, you can see what the text looks like for um, how a young person could read it or how old a reader they'd have to be to read it. I do take issue with some of the things in here. Lloyd Bloom's got some deer there. If Henry saw a deer, he may have only seen one once. Uh, we will get to that issue in a little bit. I also kind of wonder, uh, one of Robert Burley's statements here, he says, Walden is not a long book. Really? <laughs> Seemed long to me when I first read it. Well, for a young person, I think it's a long book. Anyway, he says, Walden is not a long book, but it is filled with wonderful sentences that grab at your mind and stay in your ear. With complete ease, Thoreau's best writing moves from luminous description to hard kernel-like sayings to a kind of wordplay that is both serious and full of fun. Here are some examples. And then he's got some quotes like, the bluebird carries the sky on his back. Yeah, well, so that turns out into a better thing, but Walden's not a long book. Mm, yeah, I don't know if I would have said that. It's kind of a general statement that I, I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> I wouldn't have said that. But otherwise, this is a simple biography, too, that you could hand to somebody. And again, out of print. OK, next up is Into the Deep Forest with Henry David Thoreau by Jim Murphy, illustrated by Kate Kiesler, came out in 1995. Really skinny book. I probably could have showed you this in the picture book episode, too. This one starts out with a five page introduction of Henry. Here's drawing of Henry. Uh, his cheeks look a little poofier than I'm used to seeing, but that's OK. Um, and then what happens is after the introductions, we get double page spreads with illustrations on one side, um, line drawings and text on the other. And what the text is gleaned from is Thoreau's journal about one of his trips to Maine. There they are in the canoe. And so this is really about one of the trips to Maine. That's why it's called Into the Deep Forest. So if you like the Maine genre of Thoreau, you might think of getting this one for yourself. Otherwise, it's kind of nice little segment, especially since a lot of the other books focus solely on the Walden experiment. This one doesn't. That's kind of different and nice too. So Into the Deep Forest went out of print a couple of years ago, uh, but still kind of nice. Now, in the picture book episode, I showed you two picture books by Ohio teacher Donna Marie Shibayuski. So I'm going to show you the rest of her books here to date. And first up are two coloring books. One is called Henry David Thoreau, author, philosopher, naturalist. And then the other one is called Born in the Nick of Time. And so Donna Marie calls these discussion starter discussion starter coloring books because she talks about one aspect of his life in text above, has a drawing of it, which she does herself, and then has space on the other side for you to draw something relevant 
yourself. And let's see, hearkening to what I told you last time <clears throat> in the picture book episode or during my one rant about one of my pet peeves, <gasps> Donna Marie got the flute right, yay! <laughs> anyway, so the first one, the one with the brown cover, um, covers basic facts about Henry. The second one, born in the nick of time, it's more his interactions with other people, his family and friends. And again, same kind of concept, you know, introduction, illustration, and a place for you to draw your own, an interactive coloring book. Very cool. You know, as a young person, I would have loved that because I was, I loved to color. Okay, Donna Marie has two standalone biographies here uh, that are focused on certain specific aspects of Henry's life. First one is Henry David Thoreau, Bell Ringer for Justice. You can probably figure out what this focuses on, the social just, justice aspect of his life. Uh, think spending the night in jail, helping runaway slaves get to the North, supporting John Brown, speaking and writing about him, ringing the bell when he died. No, okay. So Bell Ringer for Justice. And the second one is A Life of Joy. Childhood Memories of Henry David Thoreau. And both of these have colorful illustrations, her signature style with, with text on all two, okay? So uh, now last time I showed you what a board book was because that's a specific genre, a specific, specific, specific kind of children's book. Well, another genre within the realm of children's books are the ABC books or alphabet books. <clears throat> you can figure this out, what this is. An ABC book, in an ABC book, you take your subject, you figure out 26 pages, 26 letters, you come up with something that signifies their life in each letter, okay? So Donna Marie has done this for Henry. Um, who can he be, you know, ABC? And often the ABC books rhyme that's part of their charm, all right? So she's got colorful illustrations. Here's the D and E pages, and there's a rhyme. D is for swimming ducks on Walden Pond. Of them in the loons, Henry was most fond. E is for Emerson, mentor and friend, the land for Henry's cabin he did lend. Okay, so you got to rhyme when you do this. Now, if you've ever tried to do this kind of activity yourself, you know that the sticking point comes towards the end when you get to the letter X. What are you gonna do for X? What Donna Marie did for X is she made Henry extraordinary. X is for extraordinary man. Henry David Thoreau, I am his fan, as we all are. Okay, I think that's a valid, I think that's a valid way to, to figure out how to do the X. All right, and that's Donna Marie's books for now. She's prolific. Uh, I think she's working on something right now as I speak. So, so there will be more. Thank you, Donna Marie. Another ABC book specifically about Thoreau came out by illustrator Michael McCurdy and it's called Walden, Then and Now, An Alphabetical Tour of Henry Thoreau's Pond. And Michael McCurdy's signature woodcut engravings, which I absolutely love. I mean, absolutely love. And so the way he dealt with the alphabet and the rhyme is that he rhymed over two letters. So he's got the illustration, so this is I and J. He's got the, uh, the rhyme going across. Uh, and so two letters rhyme. And then he's got individual text down below to illustrate. And so I is for the winter ice that made this pond like stone. J is for the joy he felt at being all alone. Much as I love Michael McCurdy's illustrations, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in F for the flute because he got it wrong. Oh, darn. I so wanted to like this book. <laughs> he got it wrong. I don't know how that happens. 
but it does even to somebody quite accomplished like Michael McCurdy. Now, how did he deal with X? He had a good way out of it, I think, because it goes with W. W is for the woodchopper who worked in summertime. X is for the unknown word we'd need for a good rhyme. Why not admit defeat? Really? Why come up with something weird or something that doesn't really start with X? It sounds like it does. Anyway, that's a decent idea. That's a decent idea. So there's an assignment for you. Figure out ABCs of Henry, 26, 26 concepts. I'll start with a different letter. Figure out how to deal with X. So now by now, in our day, in the 21st century, there are lots of other biographical series out there for kids. And Henry Thoreau sometimes shows up in them. Take a look at them. They vary widely uh, by whether they follow the facts or not. Um, uh, you know enough now to look at them, figure out if you should hand it off to uh, a young person or not. If you'd like to have some check marks, look to see if they put in burning the woods. Look to see how they deal with John Brown, okay? Um, those are those are things that need to be included, I think, and, and um, you have to do it in a logical way. And, and that's, ah, that's what I can tell you. So next up are fiction books. And we're going to start with historical fiction. Now, these are books that are set in Henry's lifetime. And he shows up as a character in them. Yes. All right. You've probably read things like that. I showed you some of those in the adult fiction section of these videos. But first, you knew there was a but coming, didn't you? Let me emphasize again, as I did with the fiction books, you, you should not sacrifice basic facts for the sake of telling a good story, okay? A book of historical fiction is going to weave the real Henry into a fictional situation. It still has to be plausible. It still has to be based on what we consider to be the basic facts, okay? And it's... It's easy enough for a writer to find the basic facts, pick up Laura's book, pick up Walter Harding's or Bob Richardson's biography. There you go. There are the basic facts. And then how do you weave that into a fictional story? Okay. Um, and that's where your imagination comes in. Um, what people often mess up on are the, what I'm going to call the nuances of daily life back then. You can do all the research possible. And you can still make certain assumptions about life back then that are, are just going to be wrong. And they can be proven wrong by those of us who read and read and read and read and know. So I'm going to interject here four daily life errors that are often made in books that feature Henry Thoreau. Aspiring writers, take note. So... Moving my things around here, number one. Here's a picture of the North Bridge. The North Bridge in Concord spans the Concord River and is part of the Minuteman National Historical Park. Famously, it is the site where the colonials met the British regulars who were wearing the red jackets on the morning of April 19th, 1775, and began what we now consider to be the American Revolutionary War. A lot of you have probably been to this site. Please notice that the bridge is made of wood. This is why in Emerson's famous poem, The Conquered Hymn, which also gave us the line about the shot heard round the world, he referred to this structure as the rude bridge not because it was impolite, but because it was made of wood instead of stone. It was more temporary than permanent. To which the original North Bridge, old North Bridge, came down in 1788. <clears throat> it was not rebuilt in Henry's lifetime. He never saw a bridge at this point. He and John did not paddle their boats under, under this bridge. Uh, John and Henry and their friends and relatives did not walk or run over this bridge. There was no bridge there, which 
is why Nathaniel Hawthorne in Mosses from an Old Manse said that he had lived in the Old Manse for three weeks before he could before he could figure out which way the river flowed because there was no landmark. There was no no way to to watch exactly how the river flowed. Okay. No North Bridge. Please don't put it in any of Henry's stuff. Okay. <laughs> Uh, daily life error number two. This is a picture I took the other day of the Thoreau plot at Sleepy Hollow Cemetery up on Authors Ridge in Concord. Got the big family stone with two parents' names, four children, all of their dates, and the headstones of every member of the family, all six. Okay. Here is Henry's headstone as it was the other day. Somebody left him a pencil. Usually he's, he's left all kinds of other things. Uh, this, is, this is actually not as much stuff as he usually gets. Anyway, they're up on Author's Ridge. They're there now, but that's not where Henry was originally buried first. No, where the family was originally buried first is way down the hill as close to Concord Center as you can get and still be in that cemetery in the Dunbar family plot. Why? Because Henry's mother, Cynthia, was a Dunbar. Here are some of the Dunbar stones. You can see Aunt Louisa and Uncle Charles. And so the Thoreaus would have been there and Henry would have been there joining his father, his older sister, Helen, and his brother, John. And it wasn't until after their sister, Sophia, died in 1876 that the whole family was moved up up there to Authors Ridge, what we now call Authors Ridge. The other thing to consider is, of course, when Henry died in 1862, the other authors were still alive, except for Margaret Fuller, of course, who was tragically lost at sea. And the marker for her is in Mount Auburn Cemetery. So nobody else was up on Authors Ridge except for Lizzie Alcott. Um, nobody else was up there. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson's first wife, Ellen, isn't even there. She's in Mount Auburn Cemetery too. So, so yeah, so be careful. He was not buried immediately up on Authors Ridge. Okay, so that might be a fine line to some people, but to those of us who know the details, it, it, we, it, we, it matter, matters to us and we kind of care, okay? Number three, mammals. There weren't as many in New England. There weren't as many big ones in New England back then as we have now. And Henry famously actually mentions this in his Natural History of Massachusetts essay. He says, the big animals were already gone and he makes a list of them. The bear, the wolf, the lynx, the wildcat, the deer, the beaver, the marten. He said that otters were rarely seen and minks weren't seen as much as they used to be. Now, a lot of those animals have come back, but don't assume that nature is the same, okay? Just like these man-made structures and facilities change. Don't assume that nature is the same either. I mean, we kind of think it's always there, but no, there were changes. There were major changes. So Henry may have seen a deer once, but no bear, no beaver, no, no. Um, so mammals, pay attention to mammals. Similarly, birds. Same deal. There were some birds that had a more southern range at the time. Bird expert Peter Alder, Alden can tell you this. There were some birds that didn't make it to New England in Henry's day. The cardinal was one of them. Henry never saw a cardinal. Can you um, believe that? Isn't that amazing? So no, he didn't go out on a winter day and see a flash of red like we do. No, sorry, he didn't. No mockingbirds, no tufted titmice, no Carolina wrens, okay? They weren't in the New England range yet, okay? In the other direction, Henry, of course, saw tons of passenger pigeons, tons, which we don't have now because they went extinct in 1914. What do we have instead? Flocks of starlings. Henry never saw a starling. No, starlings were not here in Henry's lifetime. They didn't come until a generation after him. 
how, why? Well, that's when amateur ornithologist Eugene Schieffelin decided that North America needed all the birds that were mentioned in Shakespeare's plays. So he brought over starlings from England and in 1890 released 60 of them in New York's Central Park. Didn't like that the way that worked out so well. So the next year he released 40 more, 1891. And from those 100 birds, we have gotten all of our starlings. Henry never saw a starling. Okay, so, so pay attention <laughs> to these kinds of nuances. Whenever you write something, think to yourself, okay, how do we know that? <laughs> how do we know that? Um, yeah, those are, you know, maybe, maybe you think, okay, those are little fine lines, but yeah, I think they make a difference. So historical fiction that involves Henry, that's our second category today. So look at Walden and think, is there a vignette in Walden? Here's my old Walden. Is there a vignette in here that is an easy story to, to pull out for kids? Go to the Brute Neighbors chapter and look at the paragraph about the mice that live under the cabin and about how Henry says, you know, one came up and used to run all over him and he used to feed him. Okay, well, that's a cool story. That's a cool story. We can make that a children's book. And so Mary, Mary Lynn K. Roach, author of Down to Earth at Walden, also wrote The Mouse and the Song illustrated by Joseph Lowe, came out in 1974. I could have shown this in the picture book episode, but the text is a little bit more than the standard picture books. Uh, nice little, nice little, uh, nice little watercolor uh, mouses. <gasps> Joseph Lowe got the flute right. Okay. Little victories, <laughs> little victories. Okay, so that's the mouse and the song. Similarly, we have Little Mouse, the mouse who lived with Henry David Thoreau at Walden Pond by Bill Montague. And the illustrations are by Maxine Payne, came out in 1993, same kind of deal. It's about the mouse, um, black and white drawings. It's about the mouse in Thoreau's house. That is a good, that is a good thing to, yeah, it's a good story to pull out. Ramping this theme up a little bit is My Journey on the Merrimack and Concord Rivers by Ellen Gaines, illustrated by Clinton Arrowwood and journal drawings by B.J. McElderry. It is part of a series planned called The Adventures of Elliot Clinton Rat III. And so now we've moved up to a rat instead of a mouse. And Elliot Clinton Rat III lives in Lowell with his, in the mills, <laughs> why not, uh, with uh, his whole family, including his brother Bartholomew, who goes by Bew. And in this book, uh, Elliot and Bew decide to shuffle off the Lowell mills and take a trip a la Henry and John and go down the river, but they're gonna go upriver. They're gonna go from Lowell to Concord, okay? And they're gonna end up, uh, Elliot's gonna end up at Walden Pond. And so, so that's where we are with those. And so uh, here's somebody they meet along the way. Yeah, so this one is supposed to have a sequel where Elliot is living at Walden with Henry, a la the mouse kind of story. Um, that one has not yet come out could. I don't know. All right. Those are the animal stories. What about Mr. Thoreau interacting with the children of Concord? Because after all, these are children's books or young people, adults, young people books, um, and young people want to read about young people. So we have Finding Her Way by Angie Fagan came out in 1997. In here, it's the year 1845, and this is Rachel Curtis. And you can see she is meeting Henry Thoreau, and you can see that she is she is doing artwork. Rachel lives on a farm outside of Concord, and she's kind of, uh, let's say, tired of the stereotypes about women in that time. <laughs> she wants to be an artist, and that's a hard thing when you're a woman on a farm. So uh, she meets Henry. She also meets Margaret Fuller. Both of them, of course, encourage her to follow her different drummer and pursue her artwork, but she doesn't have money to go to art school. 
So Margaret introduces her um, through correspondence to an artist she knows in New York City, and she starts writing to him. And you're sort of you're sort of convinced by the end that Rachel will indeed find her own way. It's been a long time since I read this, but I think it was okay. I don't quite remember. It would have been nice to have a little factual thing about Henry at the end or at the beginning. Any of one of these, I think they could have used that. Another one uh, with a young girl in Concord is Claire Russell's Dear Mr. Thoreau, came out in 2020. This is what you could call an epistolary novel because it's all told in letters, 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 letters. Now they're not dated, so we don't know exactly what years they represent, although when you compare them to things happening in Henry's life, you can kind of figure it out. Um, this is Mary Bright, and she's, again, this is fiction. She's writing to Henry. She wants to meet him. She's heard about him. They live in Concord, and they start corresponding. They do meet, um, and the, the correspondence continues. Okay, um, so those are the girls that Henry interacts with. And then we have a boy story, so to speak, The Wayfarer's Tree by Ann Culver and Stuart Graff came out in 1973. And here we have, there's Henry, here we have young Joel Payne, <clears throat> usually lives in New York City with his parents, but they have to go traveling for a year in Europe. So he's shuffled off to an aunt, uncle, and two cousins in Concord, Massachusetts. New York City to a farm in Concord, Massachusetts. Wow, uh, big change for him. He goes to school with his cousins at Frank Sanborn's school, but he's not doing too well in Latin. And so it is uh, suggested that he go to Henry David Thoreau and be tutored in Latin. And so that's how he meets Henry. Uh, I will say that uh, the kids in the book see deer tracks and a beaver dam and no, okay. But other than that, it's not a bad story um, about uh, and, uh, about a young boy and uh, how he meets how he meets Henry and, and what Henry's doing and all that kind of stuff. All right. So otherwise, it's a good story other than the nature kind of glitches. Now we have A Mind with Wings, the story of Henry David Thoreau by Gerard and Loretta Hausman came out in 2006. Notice that it's the story of Henry David Thoreau sort of biographical fiction, okay? Talks about, it it's tells his life, but it's doing it in a fictional way. Um, these other ones, you know, are just a little segment of his life, but this is, this is like his whole life. Taught in conversations a lot with, between Henry and Ellery Channing. Um, back in the day when we were little, <laughs> or before a lot of you were born, they used to write biographies for children like this um, that made them more animated by doing conversations. But then researchers would say, you know, you're fabricating these conversations. This is, you know, don't do this. Even to attract children, don't do this. So that style fell out of favor as far as a biography is concerned. This is considered fiction, all right? Is considered fiction. So it's kind of surprising that this is, that, that te technique is used, but it's for his whole life. Okay, so a mind with wings, it is fiction. I would call it biographical fiction. And then also don't forget the night the row spent in jail, play still being performed, it's in, written in play form. Okay, if you have not read it, you should, you should. Groundbreaking, just as groundbreaking as Elliot Porter's coffee table book and far as far as the row studies go. And I talked about it <clears throat> in the fiction episode. So next up is contemporary books. And we have three series where <clears throat> the books are set in our time, or at least in a present day, depending on when the author wrote them. And in these books, there are characters who have been influenced by Henry. So Henry may or may not show up, um, but it's set in our time, okay? First up, are the Hall Family Chronicles by Jane Langdon. There are eight in the series. This is number one and number four, The Diamond in the Window and The Fledgling. They're the only two I've read out of the eight. They may be the most transcendental of all of them. I um, 
I've been told that by other people. But I like them enough that I may go back and read the whole series. Jane Langdon, I talked about her in the fiction episode because she also wrote mysteries for adults. The Homer Kelly Mysteries series takes place a lot in Concord. By the way, <clears throat> I recommended in the fiction episode that you read God in Concord. Did you do that yet? Hilarious book. Simply hilarious scenes in that book, even despite the fact that it's a murder mystery. <laughs> um, Jane Langdon lived in Lincoln, right across the Lincoln line, just southeast of Walden Pond on Breaker Farm Road. So she knew the territory. She knew about the work of the transcendentalists. And so uh, she knew her stuff. And she was quite prolific writing both for adults and for children. And so uh, you can see maybe the age of who this is written for, but adults can read them too. So this is the story of the Hall family. Uh, and they live in a big Victorian house near the corner of Walden and Everett Streets in Concord, a real Victorian house. Here is a drawing depiction of it. Um, I think Jane Langton was obsessed with this house because it shows up in the Homer Kelly mysteries too. Here's a picture of the real house. It really does exist. Okay, and it's not, you know, standard New England boxy architecture, obviously, and that's why it stands out to people. So um, the Halls live in that house. And the first, this is an unconventional family. We've got Eleanor and we've got Eddie and they live with Uncle Freddie and Aunt Lily, who are brother and sister. Um, they're very into the transcendentalist. Uncle Freddie is over the wall about the transcendentalist. He has busts of them. He talks to them, yada, da, da, da. But uh, at the core of these books is magical realism. Uh, think, think Madeline Lee Engels, A Wrinkle in Time, okay? Um, in the first one, Eleanor and Eddie get to solve a family mystery by going on adventures in their dreams. And they get to meet Henry and they get to meet Louisa May Alcott. They do some time traveling in their dreams and so all of the books are sort of magical realism. In this one, The Fledgling, uh, another young person who joins the family, Georgie, she wants to be able to fly like a Canada goose. Um, so magical realism. And they're, and they're really, really cool, good, good books, good books to read. Um, by the way, this um, in later in the series, Uncle Freddy starts a school in that big old house. And in real life, there is now a school uh, for young women who have experienced trauma in this house. So it's a huge building and it is being put to good use. And um, Jane Langdon foreshadows the school in, in her books. So that's the Hall Family Chronicles. There are eight of them. Start. She started, this one came out in 1962. Again, we're talking about when these books came out. So a newer series are the Alvin Ho books. Let me show you the title page because the barcode's kind of Alvin Ho, all right, by Lenore Look and Lei Wim Pham. Uh, Lei Wim Pham draws the, draws the pictures, draws the, draws the little pictures, um, the illustrations. And Alvin Ho is, this, is obviously the hero of the story, the center and the main character. He and his family live in Concord. They are Asian American. Alvin has um, an older brother and a younger sister, so he's the middle child. And um, this one is number two in the six episode series. There may be more coming. This is subtitled Alvin Ho, Allergic to Camping, Hiking, and Other Natural Disasters. Back in the day, Alvin is the kind of person that we would have called a scaredy cat. He is afraid of many things. And he is afraid to speak in public. And so he can talk to his family and friends, but he cannot say a word in school. Not a word. Um, but his teacher knows this and is sympathetic. Here he, here he is with his teacher. Um, and um, he is scared of everything. And, and people try to, to get him to do things and, and you know, get out of that kind of mode. Uh, which he can or cannot do. But he has an alter ego. He knows he could be brave if he was firecracker man. So uh, when he needs to be 
to be brave or um, outgoing. He could be firecracker man. So in this one, they do call upon the image of Henry David Thoreau and father, um, Alvin's father takes him camping. But of course, there's all kinds of scary things that could happen when you're camping. Um, but of course, the lesson of all these books is, you know, things aren't as scary as you think they're going to be. Anyway, Alvin, Alvin Ho, he's a pretty cool kid. Um, that's the only one I've read out of the six, but I, I would love to read more. We're moving up to high school level, right? And our last series that I'm going to talk about are the Larry books by Janet Tashian. And we have three of them. There are three. The Gospel According to Larry, Vote for Larry, and Larry and the Meaning of Life, right? So it's a three book series by Janet Tashian. Uh, first one came out in 2001, last one came out in 2008. So that's when they've been written. And here, the main character is Josh Swenson. He is 17 years old when we meet him first. He's a senior in school. He lives in the Boston area, an unnamed town in the Boston area. He rides his bicycle a lot so he can get around. Similarly to Alvin Ho, Josh tends towards introversion. <clears throat> he has a really good friend in his next door neighbor, Beth. But other, other than that, he, he doesn't, he's not outgoing. But he found, finds an outlet online where he can post things that he's passionate about. And he's been influenced by Thoreau. So he's passionate about fighting crass consumerism and also environmental degradation. So he likes to go online and write posts, not necessarily like blog posts, but he can write posts. And he signs himself as Larry. So the gospel according to Larry is his website. And he just puts out what, he, what he's feeling. Famously, Larry, has only 75 possessions. That includes clothes. That's pretty admirable. <laughs> of course, he's a senior in high school. He hasn't lived decades and accumulated lots of stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, so he keeps his identity as, of Larry. Larry's, Larry's column, Larry's website starts to get fame. And he keeps to himself, even from Beth and even from his stepfather, Peter, he keeps it kind of secret. Well, he keeps it secret until he can't anymore. And that's, that's really all I can say. So in the first two books, The Gospel According to Larry and Vote for Larry, um, we have environmental stuff. We have political stuff that's, that's going on, especially it, it's so relevant to what we've been living through. I can tell you that. Um, but I can't tell you more about the plot. And then the third one, Larry and the Meaning of Life. Look at the photo there. This book is set where? At Walden Pond. At Walden Pond. You might recognize that. So <clears throat> I know when I say this one's based at Walden Pond, the others are sort of regional. You're going to want to jump to this one. Please don't. Please read all three in the row because you're going to come into characters here and backstory that you're not necessarily going to understand. They are all standalone books, but they're also a series and I highly recommend them, but I highly recommend that you read them in order. The Gospel, According to Larry, Vote for Larry, and then Larry and the Meaning of Life. And wow, they are, they are thought provoking and they are good. And Adults, yes, you can read them, you know, um, they're wonderful. Don't forget about the two young adult novels that I also included in the fiction episode. That's My Contract with Henry by Robin Vopel and Being Henry David by Cal Armistead. Those are worth reading as well. Both are set in our time as contemporary fiction. And then I am winding up here. The last books are graphic novels. Now, that is a publishing term, okay? And that is what some people would have called comic books, okay? Please don't call them comic books. In the vernacular now, we call these 
graphic novels. And that means that they tell the story completely in illustrations. But for older readers, you know, these are not necessarily picture books for the little, okay? All right. They're told what you would think of as a comic book, but please don't call it that. Um, so we have Thoreau at Walden by, ba by John Porcellino came out in 2018. And John takes Henry's words from Walden and puts illustrations to them. And so these are excerpts from Walden. I went to the woods because I went, wish to live deliberately. There he is planting the beans. So it is the Walden, as the title says, Thoreau at Walden. It is the Walden experiment in Henry's own words told in graphic novel style, even though technically it's not a novel, it's not really fiction. Okay. It's, it's sort of, it's a, it's Henry talking. It's a biography. Okay. Yeah. And then the other one that we have in the Thoreau genre for graphic novels is Thoreau, A Sublime Life by A. Dan and Maximilian Leroy. Uh, and this too is a biography, uh, more colorful, uh, sometimes without words, obviously. Uh, and this covers the whole realm of Thoreau's life and um, does use Henry's words, but does uh, do other things as well. And does include the John Brown stuff, kind of graphically, graphic novel, but kind of graphically. So there are some admittedly dark moments here. I like the fly leaves too. Look at that. Yeah. So this is a biography of Thoreau told in what we call graphic novel style. Um, very colorful. And, and so it is biographical and it is a different way of telling Henry's story and of talking about Henry. Once again, all the books that I mentioned here are listed on travelswiththoreau.com and on the link below. Um, and wow, I know that was a lot to cover, um, but you know, I, I want to make my points. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I do. Uh, so thank you for joining me. Thanks for sticking with me on this episode of Studying Thoreau next time, because I'm, we're going in sequence here. Next time, we're going to start covering the other transcendentalists. Oh, yeah, we're going to start covering them. And um, in the meantime, I'm, I'm going to record a couple of standalone uh, episodes of, of videos that, that are not about studying Thoreau, but are about other aspects and lists. So watch for them too. They'll be coming sometime in the next couple of weeks and months. So onward, onward, onward. There's so much to talk about, Henry, you know, it just is. So thanks for joining me. Feel free to subscribe with a red button below, ring the bell up top. If you want to get notifications whenever a new video is posted, please write a comment. Have you read some of these books? What do you think? Please read the Larry books. Oh my gosh. I'd love to hear what you think of the Larry books. Really, really. Okay. So that's it for me today. I will see you next time. My name's Corrine Smith. Take care, everybody.